In this video, we'll be discussing a 4.2 on evolution and speciation. This is part of the standard level or core content. So one way to describe evolution is a change in heritable characteristics in a population. And those are two important parts of that definition. So they need to be things that can be passed on to offspring. And we're not talking about one individual, we're talking about an entire population. There are several things that can cause evolution. Natural selection is one of them, okay? So one of the early thoughts about how species change over time was called Lamarckism. And Lamarck was a um, biologist who thought that um, organisms could acquire traits throughout their lifetime and that those acquired traits could then be passed along to offspring. And that was fine at the time, but has since been falsified. So that falsification process was um, really important to leading to new ideas and here we are we've arrived at the theory of evolution so the theory of evolution is more in line with maybe you've heard of it as like Darwinism and we'll talk a lot more about how that process works but when we say theory we don't mean something that we're not sure about or just guessing the theory of evolution is supported by so much evidence and is so central to our understanding of biology that it's not likely to be falsified in the same way that Lamarckism was. Now, when we say evolution is a change in heritable characteristics, it's important to make the link to DNA. So DNA is that molecule that is responsible for storing and transmitting hereditary information. DNA contains the codes for making proteins, okay? And so when I'm looking for evidence of evolution, I can look for changes in DNA or similarities in DNA between organisms um, or their proteins, that amino acid sequence. And we have lots of different pieces of evidence to suggest that evolution has and is currently still taking place. So one of which being that new sequences of DNA arise through mutation, and some become more common. So mutations can be good, mutations can be bad, mutations can be neutral. Some of those mutations may provide organisms an advantage in their environment, and we would expect those to become more common. We can actually see that happening, right? So that's one piece of evidence. Um, some genes are common to many species. So that tells us that these species probably came from a common ancestor. And then finally, genes in closely related species are more similar than those genes in more distantly related species. So this is a great example of both unity and diversity. Unity in the fact that some genes are common to many species. So maybe we can go here and underline these. In terms of unity, some genes are common to many species. Okay, and genes in closely related species are going to be similar. But in terms of diversity, we would expect new sequences to arise and become more common depending on environmental uh, pressures. One super clear piece of evidence we have for evolution by natural selection is actually artificial selection. And artificial selection um, is another term associated with what we call selective breeding. And selective breeding is exactly what it sounds like. It's control, that's the selective part, over which individuals in a population get to reproduce. And this is how plants and animals were domesticated and continue to be domesticated. So let's say I'm a farmer and I want to grow really tall trees. <laughs> um, so instead of letting them just reproduce on their own, I'm going to take the two tallest trees and I'm going to select them to be the breeders for the next population. And so when I plant trees or plant seeds for this next population, I'm going to plant seeds that only arise out of this breeding pair. When I do that, you can see that my resulting population is bigger than my first population on a whole. 
if I do this over many generations, I'm going to end up with trees that are much different than my original population. So this is the whole idea between artificial selection, humans deciding which traits are more desirable. Um, and that's very different than natural selection where that trait, um, which trait is desirable depends on the environment at that time, but the mechanism is the same. And so the thought here is if we can do it, if we can change species over time based on desirable traits, then that can happen in the natural world as well. Another great piece of evidence for evolution is something called a homologous structure. Homo means same. These are structures that have the same evolutionary origin. And so it's a structure that they inherit from a common ancestor. And when we're looking at homologous structures, we would expect structural similarities, not necessarily same functions, okay? So a great example here um, is the pentadactyl limb. And this is something that lots of different species inherited from a common ancestor. So you can see that this structure looks a little bit different because these species diverged, but if you break down the individual structures, you'll see that they very clearly all come from the same common ancestor. They follow the same pattern. They have different functions. So for example, I use my arm to grab things and a bat is using its arm for flying. So the function may be different, but the structure is the same because they come from the same common ancestor. This is evidence for evolution, not necessarily an explanation of why evolution happened or how, okay? It's just a great piece of evidence because it supports the idea that the most simplest explanation for how such diverse organisms all got the same structure is if they come from the same common ancestor and then that ancestor evolved into different species. Homologous structures are the result of what we call divergent evolution. So um, two species ending up with the same structure because they share a common ancestor, although that structure may have different functions. Analogous structures are quite different. These are structures that may have the same function, but they have different structural qualities because they come from different ancestral origins and that is a result of convergent evolution. So different ancestors that produce species that are very similar in terms of some kind of feature, um, most likely because those species were in similar environments. They had the same selective pressures. So a great example here are bees wings and bird wings. They are example of analogous structures. They both have the same function, which is flying, but those wings are very different in terms of like the actual structural qualities. And the reason why they differ so much in their structure is because they came from different common ancestors. Okay, the human eye and the octopus eye, same thing. Those eyes have the same function, but different common ancestors explain why the actual structures of the eyes differ so much. Now I want to point out that evolution and speciation aren't necessarily the same things. So evolution, change inheritable characteristics in a population over time, that can sometimes lead to new species, but does not always, okay? Speciation is its own event. This is specifically the formation of a new species. And in order for that to happen, these species must be reproductively isolated. So if we go back to the definition of a species, individuals that can reproduce and form fertile offspring. If you're not reproducing and forming fertile offspring, you're going to become different species. And there's lots of ways that can happen. There's lots of different ways that a separation can exist. It can be physical like the one in this picture or others. But the point here is, is that they do not interbreed and they evolve differently, okay? And even if you were to place these populations back in contact with each other and give them opportunities for interbreeding, they could not. Once they get to the point where they cannot interbreed and produce fertile offspring, they then become different species, and we say that speciation has occurred.
So in order for this process to take place, we need two things to be true. We need some kind of reproductive isolation, right? So they either have to be isolated geographically, like a river or a mountain or a lava flow, or some other type of factor that can cause populations to separate and no longer reproduce. The other thing that we would need for speciation to occur is what we call differential selection. So this is when environments have different kind of like selective pressures, and that means that there are different factors in that environment that are giving certain traits in one population an advantage, but in the other population, it's different traits that have the advantage. So when that happens over long enough periods of time, you get organisms evolving in different pathways, okay, in different ways. So this could be like um, different climates or different predators or different competitions or different types of diseases, all kinds of things. But we definitely need both of these things to be true, reproductive isolation and differential selection in order for speciation to take place.